How do you learn who you really are? It's not found in books. It's found on the battlefield. Anyways, hanging out with Dr. Saperstein. Um, yeah, you were just saying how you had your podcast and like, you know, I was worried about doing it alone. And that's why I was like, I was going to lean on somebody to do it. I did the same thing with my first book. Same oh, thing. Okay. I did the same thing on my book. I wrote, uh, everything is a choice. And when I built that, I even have a fear chapter in there, which now I would you know rewrite a little bit. But, um, when, uh, when I did that, I actually leaned, I reached out to, uh, Dr. Oren Cox, uh, PhD, and uh, he was a friend growing up, one of my good buddies growing up. And I was like, listen, I've written this book. I have all this together, but I need to have like someone with a PhD on this book. I need to have somebody out there who has a thing. I, I don't know if, who would listen to me, who would listen to me, because back then I had to face doubt. I didn't know how to beat it. And so I was like, can you just come into battle with me? And he was like, I mean, I'll read the book. He read it. He's like, this is pretty good without me. I don't think you need me to be on this. I'm like, you have a PhD, add some pages. <laughs> Right. Add some pages to this. And so he's like, fine, fine. So he had like like 10 pages of the thing. And, you know, we co-authored it then at that point because he's like, fine, I'll throw in a couple tidbits. Fine. And I'm like, right. that'll make all the difference. There's a PhD on my cover. <laughs> that did not make a difference. Nobody cared. It, because he was like, you know, if whatever sells, sells. He's not really a part of what we're doing with the thing. And uh, it didn't make a difference at all because when it came down to it, nobody really cares about that stuff. They're like, does it work or does it not work? That's all I care about, right. you know? Right. And so that's, sure. that was where I, I found the same answer. It's like, you know what, doing it alone, that, I actually don't need anybody to help me out with this. I got right. this, but I, I do love that. We're gonna, like, I'm actually very interested in getting into fear. And I have a question for you because you're, you're, sure. you're a doctor on fear. You've written, on fear. What's the name of the new book so everybody knows what to get? You, you know, it's not out yet because because my former partner and I were doing it together. Oh. And, uh, so we never completed the book um, because I wanted to start a podcast before the book was done. Uh, and I've been enjoying the podcast so much that I don't really care as much about doing the book as I am. <laughs> I love doing it. The podcast. And I don't want to bug my friend Kim to do this. Um, I may take it up myself again at some point, but really... We'll send I it out to Dr. Oren Cox. I got you. I'll send it out to him. He'll write some pages in there. And you're good. Yeah, <laughs> He'll do the same thing to, I did. <laughs> right. I want people to listen to the Fear Me Out podcast because uh, I, I've been told over and over again how helpful it is. Uh, uh, a funny story. One of my clients started listening to the podcast and he said to me, I want my money back. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, now you're giving all this stuff away for free and I had to pay for it. So... <laughs> I've got I've got one of those guys in my groups. He's hilarious. Everything every time we do something, he's like, "Well, I have an opinion." I'm like, "Great, great, share, good opinion." He's like, "So do I get a discount because I shared that?" Or... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think it's great too. I, actually, I had struggled with that for a while too. If you're giving it away, you know, like like if you if you're good at it, give it away for free. That was a Gary Vaynerchuk thing, and I was like, I don't know, how do I do that? What I've also found, and I think let me let me ask you this: Have you found too that Giving away the answers doesn't mean you have the solution. Well, I, I mean, part of the answer that I give to people is that there is no shortcut to healing. Um, you, you know, most therapy fails because it's an intellectual exercise that teaches you all about yourself, but it doesn't deal with the underlying issues. Because my uh, notion is that, first of all, I don't pathologize people to come to see me. Most people feel bad enough about themselves walking in the door. They don't need to agree. They don't need me to agree with them that there's something wrong with them. Really? So most of the time, I look at people's symptoms as a form of communication, and what their symptoms tell me is what they're struggling with on a deeper level. So that's where part, partly that's where the fear comes into the picture, because I would say that almost everyone's life is run by fear in some way or another. Some people realize it. Most people don't. Uh, so part of what I try to help people understand is that um, we turn fear into aggression and we take it out on ourselves, other people or both. Uh, so when people are self-critical, as an example, they're taking their fear and they're aggressing against themselves, rejecting themselves, uh, as an example. So um, I, I think fear is a really important thing for people to understand that you you can't live a life without fear. It's how you manage it that determines the outcome. So I've seen a couple pieces on this one. And one thing I'm noticing, you just did a push against like regular therapy. You just did a push against yes. it. 
And uh-huh. um, I'm noticing this too. This is one of the reasons I was excited to talk to you is to go like, hey, wait a second. Like we're pushing against traditional modern therapy here. We're pushing against the counselors and the therapists who are like, we're going to look at the symptoms and we're going to talk about this and I'm probably even prescribe you something and we're not going to get to any roots. And this is why when I was listening, I was like, uh, Dr. Saperstein's breaking rules right now. What's he doing? Because he's doing the actual solution and he's not, right. he's not doing just we're going to talk about your feelings and talk about the symptoms and then validate right. your symptoms so that way you have a, uh, a perpetually enabled disorder. So we're not going to keep Absolutely. doing the same thing. It looks like you're like, no, we're going to try and get rid of that for you and teach you how to beat it, not how to be identified by it. Is that fair? Um, you know, you're you're preaching to the choir. I love what you're saying because it's exactly what I believe. And um, I see so many people that have done a lot of therapy, but not other therapists. And the main feedback I get is, how come nobody's ever asked me these questions before? How come, how, how come you know, nobody's ever helped me really truly understand you know, where my symptoms come from, why I have post-traumatic stress. And and especially because I do a ton of hypnotherapy with people. That's one of the main ways I help people resolve trauma. Um, you know, people always say, well, how come nobody else is doing this? Um, at least in the community that I live in. I'm curious, what is making it so you, because I do want to get to hypnotherapy in a second, just so you know, like I'm fascinated. Okay. So I do want to get into that. But what do you think the reason is that like there's this uh, we're, we're I'm an outlier, you're an outlier, we're breaking the rules because we're actually yeah. helping people and not trying yeah. to turn a profit off of somebody's distress. Like, okay. wh- wh- what do you what do you think the reason they're not asking the questions or they're not doing the work that you're doing? Well, I think that a lot of therapists actually live in fear in relationship to the people they're working with. Really? And so, yeah, because when we go to school. Uh, as therapists, we're taught uh, to diagnose, treatment plan, and then measure the outcome. And I think that is that way of pathologizing people is extremely disrespectful and harmful. And I'm not going to say there's no such thing as mental illness and so on and so forth. And I do, you know, ask people that have post-traumatic stress to understand what that means. But, you know, if you again, if you feel bad about yourself, and I agree with you that there's something wrong with you, how does that help? Perpetuates it. You're right? able so what I really wanted people to understand is that their symptoms are talking to me mm-hmm. and that if we go deep and they are able to feel the feelings that that they didn't feel when they were being traumatized, because when people are experiencing trauma, they disconnect from what's happening and they go into a really uh, sort of disconnected state in order to survive. And that's where post-traumatic stress comes from is because it overloads your nervous system to a point where where you're just trying to make it through whatever it is that's happening. Those feelings don't go away. They just live inside your body and then start creating symptoms. So uh, I use hypnosis because it's a electrical chemical way of recreating the state that you go into when you're being traumatized. But instead of just using it for coping, I've developed a lot of different ways of helping people release the pain associated and the fear and the, the feelings of being overwhelmed and shamed or all the other things that create self-hate and, you know, and the symptoms that people uh, experience in life. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a very rebellious person. I always have been since I was a little kid. So <laughs> coming from this perspective is not new for me. <laughs> um, it's just been the way that I've always been. I've always questioned authority and I've always questioned the sort of in quotes, normal way things are done because I'm not afraid when I'm working with my clients, I feel very comfortable in the face of, the kind of trauma that is unimaginable. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that I was in therapy for many, many years when I was in my 20s. And uh, so other people's trauma doesn't trigger any reaction inside of me that I have to unconsciously come to terms with when I'm trying to help them. Mm-hmm. Well said. So I hope a lot of therapists don't go through enough therapy in order to really heal their own wounds. And so if you give me a cookbook and I follow the recipe to help somebody, and if it doesn't work, I don't take responsibility for that. I get to blame my client for not doing the recipe properly. Happens all the time. So it, that's why it's really disturbing to me because um, I think it's disrespectful. And I don't think that, generally speaking, uh, that it's helpful. You know, most self-help books, not all of them. There's some that are really good. But most of them are not designed to help 
people that read them, they're designed to help the author that wrote them. Right. Uh, but that's a little bit cynical, and I don't mean to be disrespectful. Well, well maybe, maybe, you do. Really... maybe you do. I didn't say, you didn't say all, you said some. So yeah. there are, and there's a lot of them out there too that are really good at identifying problems and seeing what's yeah. wrong, but their solution is totally off. And right. it just throws people even further into disarray. And so like the intention may be good, but the delivery is, it just creates new curses. Right. Cause I, you know, if you think about suffering and human suffering, most of it is a result of being either neglected or mistreated. So I look at therapy as an opportunity for people maybe to experience a form of clean love, maybe for the first time in their life. Mm -hmm. Because I don't work with anybody that I don't really like a lot Hmm. and feel really comfortable with. I'm extremely fortunate in that I have a waiting list and I don't need, you know, to worry about having to, you know, work with people that I'm not connecting with or don't feel comfortable with. So um, I have the luxury of, uh, working with people I take great delight in in being with. So it makes it a very pleasurable experience for me. That's awesome. I'm glad that you have that too. A lot a lot of people starting off who have good intentions uh, don't have that luxury. That's a beautiful, you're in a good spot. But it only took you, right. what, like 40 years of work to get there? No big deal. <laughs> uh, you know, I've been really fortunate. Santa Barbara uh, is a very unique place in that there's a lot of wealth here. Um, and I don't take any insurance from the medical industry. So uh, it's a fee for service practice. And it, this can only happen in a, uh, in an environment like one I live in, um, because there's so much welfare that people don't even blink when I, you know, tell them I don't take insurance and all that sort of thing. But that's, again, one of the reasons I started my podcast, because I thought, well, there's a ton of people that I can help, maybe not as directly as I would if I saw them in person, but at least I can help them understand what to look for. Uh, when they're looking for a therapist, because I've done three or four, five episodes on on what a good mental health professional looks like uh, and sounds like. So mm-hmm. doing my best to try to help people get the help they need. I love it. I salute you as a warrior because you're warrior talking right now. This is one thing I like is we challenge Thank everything. You. We should. Absolutely. We should challenge everything. We should be asking questions. We should go against the grain. Um, Absolutely. And so I do like that. I want to go back to the recipe. The people, when okay. they say they're reading the, the map they got from school, they didn't actually do the work. And so what I'm noticing is an emergence of people who do seem to fall more into what would look like holistic teaching versus medicating people. And they get more right. into like there's there's a lot of people who even with who I work with who are getting off of medication. To be very clear, I don't take them off medication after we okay. rip the roots out of what it is that <clears> they <throat> have. Like like if we beat their anxiety, we've tore their fear out of them and they're like. Now we've got this under control. This isn't an issue anymore. I don't need the medications. They're really not helping me. I don't need that because I'm not afraid of this stuff anymore. I'm not worried about that. When I'm watching people go like, I, I think I'm going to talk to my doctor. I don't think I need this anymore. What we're doing is working to the, like, I don't need to be medicated. And right. that's something that I'm finding that more and more people who have been beating it are finding that it wasn't medication that beat it. It was changing my beliefs and changing my mindset and changing my training and my perspectives on how it works. And I'm wondering if you're finding the same thing or if you're like, no, everyone should get medicated and I will take that picture. Well, first of all, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a psychologist, so I can't prescribe medicine. Um, But I do believe that part of my role as a mental health practitioner is to help people understand that some symptoms are directly related to uh, an imbalance of brain chemistry, mm-hmm. but that's a, 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 a portion. That's not everybody. And it's uh, very so small. many. Right. I, I have a test and, for you too, just for you to challenge my test. Okay. You have a what? I have a test for that to see whether oh, somebody okay. would be one of those people or not, but I didn't mean to interrupt right. your thought. I just got excited. No, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> you know, one of, the, one of the main reasons I refer people is if they suffered a head injury as a, as an example. Fair enough. Because when you when you suffer a, a concussion or a, well, have some type of brain injury, it does uh, disrupt neurotransmitters. And I think a lot of people actually could really use a rebalance for six months or so. Sure. Uh, and most neurologists and people that treat them don't even think about that part of their healing process. So, But again, we're getting a little bit off the subject. Um, I also live in a fairly liberal community. A lot of people are now microdosing and... Uh, 
Correct. In the community and using hallucinogenics to, to have healing. I'm talking like uh, psilocybin or you're going more yeah. into uh, MDMA. Yeah. Are people social dosing MDMA? Well, I'm a little nervous about MDMA because I've done a lot of reading about it. And it does, it is a neurotoxin. Sure. And and the people that take a lot of MDMA are prone to get par- to getting Parkinson's disease. And that's not something that you want to have happen. It, I think so, there, I think there's bad versions of it then because I was just I've been researching it a lot too and I haven't seen that well I mean of course anything without extreme like some maybe go to extremes right. is going to be like right. doing anything in a safe way or a healthy way is going to have Yeah. But even aspirin yeah. what happens if you take too much aspirin? Well, I can't take any because it hurts my stomach. Well, so yeah, yes. well, that's, that's exactly yeah. it. It's it's totally yeah. over the counter, but if you have too much you're dead. Right. So I mean like it's still yeah. Uh, there still has to be some sort of like, at least with balance, but I haven't seen anybody who uses it at least mildly correctly have any Parkinson's symptoms. Is that, is that... Yeah. I'm talking about it in the extreme people that of use course. it for party on a regular basis and yeah. all that sort of thing. And high doses, you'd have to be hero dosing often, but that's yeah. very, it seems like a more rare thing. Even in the community I've talked to with people, they're like, no, you don't do that. That's bananas. Like, <laughs> but yeah, psilocybin, psilocybin doing social dosing has had, uh-huh. like, I've seen only positive results so far. It is a, I think it's a miracle uh, for a lot of people. Agreed. I, I know some people that actually grow their own in their stairwell at their house or whatever uh, to make sure that it's pure and clean. Correct. Uh, there, there is a fellow that I refer people to on a fairly regular basis who is an expert on the different varieties of civil assignments so that they get the right variety because... Uh, some increase anxiety, some decrease it. I mean, again, I think you just have to have an open mind and get a lot of education about whatever it is that um, that you're considering in your healing journey. Just curious, would you be would you be willing to put his name in and promote him, or is he like, don't tell anybody about what I do? Because I just did a, I just did a podcast with a guy in California who's in L.A. area. You know, I would, I would rather that I put him in touch with you. Fair enough. Okay. I'll do a shout out for Lane Carlson because that's the guy who I work okay. with. And if you're like, well, I don't have to do it anymore, then we know. But uh, yeah, yeah. But I know <laughs> that that uh, we just did a podcast with each other, and he he does that, and he's putting it out there. Like, come and see me because he's able to really help people through that journey of being able to do it in a safe way. Right. Super important. Yeah. So no, I think that it's been it's been extremely helpful. And that's why I was looking at the hypnotherapy because I actually, it's very difficult to hypnotize me. In fact, no one's been able to do it yet. And so if you're like, this is the way that it's done, I'm like, I haven't been able to have it work yet. It's really a struggle. Like even when they do like all those mass hypnosis and stuff, I'm like, uh-huh. I don't think that it happened on me. <laughs> like everyone else is like passed out or something. Yeah. And I'm like, I, should I pretend? <laughs> like, like, yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I, I, you know, I will be honest with you. I think that hypnosis is very much misunderstood and that it's actually quite simple. And I, I, without knowing you, I know that you've been in a trance many times because it's a very common state of mind for human beings to spontaneously go into. Like if you're driving a long distance, as an example, by yourself, mm-hmm. and after an hour or so you realize, oh, my God, how would I get here? Right. You were <laughs> not really paying attention. That's what's called highway hypnosis. You okay. actually go into a trance in order to cope with the monotony of driving a car long distance. Interesting. So, so most people that say, "Well, I've never been hypnotized before," actually have experienced it. They just didn't know that that's what it was. So, yeah. um, and mm-hmm. and in the healing process, it doesn't really matter how deep into a trance you go in order to uh, garner the benefits. Some people they don't feel any different in my uh, relaxing chair then they would have, the only difference is their eyes are closed. Uh, but, the, but the healing potential is the same, whether you go into a really deep trance or whether you're just in sort of a relaxed state. Really? Because it's your intention of connecting with the pain and the fear of the trauma that you're dealing with, that your mind has a template that's built into it to, to dictate where you go and how you go about healing. Um, so really, what we're what we're doing is tapping into something that already exists inside of you. Mm, I never heard it that way, and that's helpful because, like, I'm thinking I got to be like and act like a chicken, like, bark, 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 uh, you know, exactly. like, like that yeah. point. I'm like, yeah, that never happened. Not like that at all. Yeah, I've never had one uh, of those things. <laughs> do you mind if I tell you just a real 
<laughs> Can I tell you a quick story that it kind of illustrates the point? Sure, please. Um, there's, a, there's a man who went to Africa, and he was studying predator and prey relationships, and he was uh, filming cheetahs going after, I think it was impalas, whatever they, were, whatever they eat. Mm -hmm. And what he noticed is that sometimes when they're racing across the plains really fast, all of a sudden the cheetah, I mean the uh, uh, impala falls over, and it appears to be dead. Uh, cheetahs don't eat anything that they don't kill themselves because they're not equipped to deal with anything but live kill. So like most cats, they stop, they look down, they see that this animal appears already to be dead. They bat it around a little bit like cats do. I'm assuming what they think inside is, oh, you know, I can't believe this, you know, that I, I, I think I was going to eat a minute ago. And they wander away. And then he kept the camera on the uh, impalas to see what would happen next. And what happens next is that the impala starts to tremble and its nervous system then releases the trauma after a few minutes. Uh, the impala gets up, looks around and goes, uh, you know, I can't believe I'm still alive and wanders away and it's just fine. Well, what he did was interfere with the trembling response to see what would happen. And it turns out that um, the impalas don't recover. They become really? super hypervigilant and it's what we would call uh, having post-traumatic stress, they don't, they're not able to function. Really? And so they get consumed really quickly because they've not been able to discharge the trauma from their nervous system. That's amazing. So, I've heard people say the trembling is actually a system that people have tried to use or see if that yeah. works as an out an outlet. But I haven't yeah. heard the second part where it actually induced a form of post-traumatic distress on them. Well, it releases the trauma to right. tremble. And human beings are obviously where we are. Uh, prey animals and so it does help to tremble but that's not enough because our cortex also has to be engaged in the healing process and that means we have to be we have to engage in a dialogue and an understanding that animals don't require to heal right the, the, the impala doesn't go oh my god that was so messed up like i can't believe that guy almost ate me i feel like i'm he still being chased yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, you know, I just found that to be really fascinating because um, I do see people tremble a great deal, sometimes in hypnosis as a way of their body releasing some of the uh, some of the trauma. That's amazing. OK, yeah, I, I don't I don't do a trembling system. So that's that's amazing to hear that. That's like cause I've, I've read about it, but I've never used it and I don't right. use it myself. Also interesting. I'm not going to slide by that. You said we're prey animals. Hold on a second. Are you saying that? Like the most dominant species on the planet at the moment right now because of our big, beautiful brains, our prey? Yes, because if you look at your fingers and you look at your teeth, you do not have claws like prey animals do. I mean, like predators do. And you don't have big, giant eye teeth. Mm -hmm. So the reason that we have become predators is because we live in fear. Interesting. And we use our brain power in order to dominate as a way of compensating for our vulnerability. Okay, I gotta say I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> I gotta say I love it. Okay, so yeah, we're 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 bunnies with guns, is what we are. Yes, and and if you think about them, most mammals live in groups. Most mm -hmm. prey animals live in groups, right? You don't find monkeys in condos living separately from each other, right? You know, they live all over each other. The only ones that are excluded from the group are the uh, adolescent males, which we all know. No offense, are a pain in the ass. They are. And, and the sick, yeah. right? But all the rest of them live together because the closer they are together, the less likely they're going to be uh, preyed upon. That's a that's a great catch. Right? It's only us human beings who have adopted the false notion of independence that live in fear all the time and have to have be fully armed and, you know, and dangerous because in reality, we are really vulnerable as human beings. So... Part of what I try to help people understand is that dependency is not a weakness. It's a strength. Mm -hmm. If you acknowledge it and you don't spend your life fighting it. It's so funny that the terminology be, would be what people fight. Because even with our guys, like even when I teach, well, I, I teach men, um, I have the men's group for um, the Warriors Way. I work with men across the world. And uh -huh. we talk together. We're stronger. Like, you know, we all balance each other out. We teach each other in the weaknesses. Like we're, we're always stronger together. There's nothing. You can't beat us together. And it's, and it's funny that we don't well, we don't call it dependency because guys would be like, oh no, no, I'm not dependent. <laughs> I'm not dependent. I'm not codependent right. on you guys. I'm fine, you know. Like, 
But I'm like, what I do is I call it black box thinking, you know, just like the, there's a book on that where like we all just bring our information as alphas together, share with each yeah. other what's working best. And then we all go back and we lead our packs, you know. And well, how, sad, how sad is it that we have been shamed into being uh, contrary to our nature? It's interesting that it's it's sad that I would say some are accepting the belief because the guys who I'm with, I'm like, we reject that belief together. We are stronger is different. But you're right. Guys are being shamed into isolation because uh, how do you beat the alphas? Well, right. you make them beat themselves. Well, think about when Reagan was president. His stupid notion was peace through strength. Right. There's no peace through strength. There's peace it's, through cooperation. It, and That's like, and that's like today's that, strategy, peace through hate. Well, I mean, of course. It's been, it's been, it's <laughs> that's been taken the, to an extreme. That's but the think path. About people that, but think about the people that propagate that are the, the most uh, damaged, weak. Super terrified. Uh, mentally ill people that live on our planet. And people so, in the strong have to accept it. Like, I guess if she's mad at me or I guess if that person says I'm a piece of shit or I should shut up because I'm a guy, all right, I guess I should just shut up. It's like, wait a second. They can't stop you. Like, they can't actually make you. You have to make you. It's the only way to beat you is you have to censor yourself. It's the only way. Right. It's Well, I, I, and look, the best way to control people is to divide them so you can conquer them. But together we're strong. Yes. Yeah, so I, I'm, we do, I'm we do really more. need each other. I'm liking you more and more, Doc. Right. <laughs> thank you. All right, let's get let's get back to the people who are dividing. Like, first off, thank you for explaining the hypnotherapy thing. That's cool. The cheetah thing, and and listen, I'm recognizing that we're ultra predator slash prey. So this is uh this is the part where I want to get into the the recipe. You said people reading the recipe book to heal. People. And I've been challenging this one now for, it's been well over a year, I've been a little loud about it, where I say okay. challenge everyone's competency. Are they actually good at this or are they just reading the recipe book? And right. what I'm noticing is the people who have the courage, like you said, I've been through enough hell that I go in and help people get out of it. And I'm not afraid to go into hell. I grew up in hell. You know, when I explain my story, I grew up in Sparta. I did not grow up in a nice area. Did not have right. a nice childhood. My father would be a clinical sociopath. My, you know, my mom had all of her issues and left. And there's a whole lot of issues all in between. Every type of abuse except for sexual, and it just may be repressed. I haven't found it. In any case, <laughs> in any case, I've gone through all of this stuff and had to break all the generational curses and beat all of the things to there. And because I have beaten my demons, broke my curses, and let go of the bonds that hold me back. Um, because I'm still I'm strong in these areas, and I now I'll face whatever demons other people are facing. I go into hell every right. day, and I go, "Come and get you." I know where you are. I grew up there. I'm coming to get you. Just have your shoes on, because I'm not carrying you out. I'm like, okay. "I'll show you the way." And I go in there, and I, I metaphorically will find all these people standing by a broken bridge. And I'm like, "What are you guys doing here?" They're like, "Well, this person who's got a book out, and they did this thing, and they got a plaque on their wall." They said, uh, they said, what I need to do is I need to uh, go over to here. There should be a bridge that you go over, and that's the way you get out of hell. And I'm like, there hasn't been a bridge there for decades. You guys are standing. What are you guys talking about? Well, the, the guy with the, the, the degree said that there's a bridge here, and I feel like I'm a piece of shit because I'm letting him down. I'm not doing a good job. I'm failing in everything. It's just reinvigorating how shitty I am as a human being because – even the guy with the book is saying, here's what the right thing to do. And I can't do it. I can't get across. There's no bridge. And I don't, I must have fucked it up. Did I destroy the bridge? And I'm like, this has not been the way out of here for a long time. <laughs> we have to go this way. And you got to go through the despair fields. You got to go through the fear monster. You got to go by distractions. We got this whole excuse thing that's going to try and stop you. And then you got to go and face your own things in order to get out of this. You, this is, this is a dead end. It's been a dead end for a long time. Yes. Because people are taught that their problems are external to themselves. That's a good and observation. They are taught. Part of that. what I try to help people realize is that the more you connect with your inner truth, not to become self-centered because that's obnoxious, and but to become centered lie. in yourself. Big difference between the two. Mm -hmm. so by, 
by my teaching people how to be centered in themselves, they start to develop a sense of competence that they've never had before because most people mess with their intuition. They mess with what they know because they've been taught not to trust themselves. Right. But once you start to really understand that one of the most sacred parts of your existence is your intuition and that it connects with, depending on whether you believe in God or whatever, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. I heard, pick, pick your thing. Yeah, it doesn't, I hear you like, get like, oh, God, I, there's a lot of people who fight this one. I'm with you. Pick whatever you pick, but I, I, I don't know where do you where do you land on it. I'm not judging either way. Well, I land on God because I was raised Jewish, and uh, there's no shame in God as a Jewish person. Yeah. No, I don't celebrate my religion because I was forced against my will. Well, faith and religion are not the same thing. Yes. So I was fortunate enough when I was in my 30s to have some incredibly powerful experiences that changed my life to help me understand that. When somebody said to me at that time, what's your religion? I'd say I'm an antagonist, <laughs> not atheist, but I, said I was an antagonist. And I readily admit it because I was so hurt and angry about being forced against my will Great. that I just rejected the whole thing. But I got super lucky that I met someone who helped me recognize that there's a huge difference to, between God and religion. Yes. So I go through life feeling a really deep connection. And that is how I manage whatever fear I might have otherwise. Because I feel like I'm working in partnership with my version of God and that whatever I need is going to be provided to me in the service of helping other people. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it a lot easier. Even if I'm batshit crazy, which I could be, it, it feels right. safe right. and good. Right. And it helps me get to a place where no matter how much pain somebody walks in my door with, I, I'm not afraid. Right. Um, you know, I've had occasions, sadly, where someone has tried to end their life and they've been referred to me. Mm -hmm. And it, it, potentially for a therapist, that's a very scary proposition, scary right? Scary call of the dealing, time, yeah. Yeah, dealing with somebody who really would have preferred to die, but got saved through a miracle or whatever. So what I usually say to someone like that is, look, I can't work with you if you won't give me six months. That's you a... got to give me six months to try to help you. You have to promise me that you won't kill yourself for six months. Mm -hmm. Because if I have to live in fear that you're going to take your life, I cannot do the best I can do. Because always in the back of my mind, I'm going to be concerned that you might take your own life. And despite how much pain that you're in, I trust that if you make a commitment to me, you'll keep that commitment. Interesting so, approach. Is, now, this is, I found the same thing in our groups, too. Is it because you've just given them a belonging and a purpose, and this is the reason you do it? Or is it really just a, a safety protocol for yourself? It's both a way of me feeling safe because if i have to be in fear all the time i can't do my best mm -hmm. and i ultimately believe that everybody has to take responsibility for themselves even if it's in the face of staying alive or dying mm -hmm. well, because the, the really piece, a lot of the time i'm sorry the pieces for that that i found were usually lacking whenever like like and, and i would take those calls i have nobody else who takes those calls i'm the only one and so like when those calls would come up it would usually come down to isolation and uh, usually some like loss of purpose and no belonging, like in the more alone and, and the less they see any hope or any purpose, the more likely the option to check out is. But once Nobody you give them a purpose and you give them a belonging and you remove isolation, like right. uh, we've actually, we haven't had a suicide call in the men's, in our men's area in almost eight months now since we created a, a nighttime group for everybody just to hang out. Right. So I, I use that as an example because I think that people, number one, need to be respected no matter what. Yeah. That, oh, look, I can't stop somebody from killing themselves if they're determined. Right. But I can ask them to make a commitment to me that if they want my help, we have to engage in a relationship together. And we have to work together to help that person get to a place where they don't feel that kind of isolation. And they feel like at least somebody cares enough about them to not try to convince them that everything's okay because that's ridiculous. But to, help them, right? but help them get to a place where maybe they can begin to feel some hope and start to heal. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, like I said, doc, the more I know you, I see you breaking rules, man. I like it. <laughs> I'm liking you more and more. I really am. This is, yeah, we have the, we have the same, the same thing. And I see you just paralleling in paths, which is not only validating to me, but also like, uh, it just gives me more credibility in your true intent, which is to help people for real. You know, and so well, I see your heart. you know, I'm, I'm an incredibly blessed person. I have a lovely wife that's willing to put up with me. I've got great kids. <laughs> I have a really successful 
practice. And so why should I not dedicate my life to the service of others? It's a good way. To, it's a good answer and a good way to look at it. And I think that's also gives us fulfillment and purpose ourselves. God does not that's ask it. easy things is what I found. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Warrior, thank you so much for being a part of the information that we have. And you're part of our story as we are a part of yours. It's very much an honor to be able to connect with each other. If you want to know more or you want to get started with working with me or working with our warriors so that you can begin your path to authenticity, strength, leadership, and accountability, this is the way. Together, we are way stronger. Now you get to choose. Do you go forward or keep doing what you've always done? If you stay where you're at, hey, click on some of the stuff and follow what it is. We got motivational stuff. We've got podcasts. We've got more things. Just subscribe and do the stuff and we'll keep you updated. But if you want to start going in, start jumping into what our programs offer and start your journey and being the hero in your own story. Uh, you know, I mean, we, there's nobody gets a life without pain, which is another thing that most people um, uh, maybe understand intellectually, but I think we all wish that we could have a life without pain. And I think that's absurd. And I think that actually causes more damage than it does. Agreed. Uh, I haven't heard this as much. Is this like, is this a common thing that people think that every day should just be happy only? You know, I can't tell you how many people come to see me and said, there's something wrong with me because I'm not happy. Interesting. And you got to help me. And my <laughs> response is, I cannot help you be happy, number one, because there is no such thing as being a feeling. You cannot be happy. Yeah. It's a myth that's been perpetuated on us to create anxiety and fear. So we buy shit we don't need. We drink too much. We eat too much. We don't take care of ourselves. Well, those because are distractions. We don't feel like we're, yeah, because we don't feel like we're happy. And that's absurd. Nobody's happy. People feel happy when they create joyful experiences. I'm gonna have fun right. with you today, Dana. I'm gonna, we're gonna have fun. Today. I'm gonna have fun with you today. I'm actually gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it because I can do psychology stuff with you, so we can actually get into some fun stuff too to get together. Okay. So, um, do you understand I, the the point that I'm trying to help people understand is that if you recognize that there's no such thing as what you're striving for, and really just to learn how to get to neutrality, so you can create joy and you can deal with pain, you're gonna feel a lot better than if you're seeing yourself as a failure because you're in quotes not happy. Yeah, I, I like I like the approach and I challenge on this one a little. I have a different definition okay. simply because I, I would even listen, Arthur C. Brooks, oh, Harvard professor. <laughs> listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna call him out a little bit because I'll have this uh -huh. debate. I'd love to have him on and have the conversation. Because he gets into the whole thing where first off, when I watch his stuff, you gotta get into Harvard so you can take his class, which is a little bit frustrating. And then you gotta right. be in the initial first group that gets into that class that sells out very quickly. So good luck with those two ones. But then the word happiness itself is highly subjective. That makes like uh -huh. everyone's got a completely different definition for this word. Like everybody, like you, if you ask a thousand people, it's a thousand different definitions. One person is going to be, it's the smell of a fall, a fall evening. Another person is going to be a, a sunrise with coffee in your hand in Hawaii. Like everyone's got totally different answers. Right. You know, and. But what if it turns out that those are momentary experiences You're that good. create joy? And of course, they're going to make you feel happy in the moment. But if you walk around that. thinking you should feel that way all the time, you're going to be bitter, disappointed in your life. You're just jumping ahead. You hold your horses, <laughs> Mr. Saperstein. Okay. You hold your horses. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this is where, like, when when uh, when Arthur's talking, he says there's three different um, points within happiness, and this is how you find it aside from getting into his Harvard class for happiness. So then you have to get into its satisfaction, purpose, and enjoyment. And okay. I was like, well, wait a second. Those are three other subjective words. <laughs> Did you just say the definition to a subjective term is three more subjective terms, and I got to get into Harvard? <laughs> I, I know people – who don't even know what you're talking about, who are happy as hell. So I don't know if that's really the, the, if that's really the way to find where happiness is hiding from everybody. So I came up so with a, a definition. I came up with a definition and I want you to be able to play with this a little bit. The definition okay. is the awareness of the blips in life that are found in nouns and verbs. And so I'll break it down yeah. for you. 
the, yeah, please. the awareness of the blips in life that are found in nouns and verbs. Sounds pretty stupid at first until you break it down. First, awareness is you have to see it. If you don't see, if you don't know it's not is there, you can't make a decision that you don't know exists. So you can't see it. You can't go, oh, is that it or not it? You have to see it first. So first, awareness. Raise your awareness. Second is what's a blip? A blip is, by definition, a temporary moment in time. It is not meant to last. It is designed to come and then go. Even the very core word for hap, for happens or happened or happiness, hap itself is, by definition, means temporary. So it means it's not supposed to be forever. And then right. life, life is how we measure time. This is in my timeline, in my life. And so it's a temporary moment in our life that's found in people, places, things, or something you love to do. Sure. And so we look at these things and people go like, um, well, what am I looking for? You're in blips or surrounded by blips all the time. It could be your favorite coffee cup. It could be a holding someone's hand. It can be a hug. It could be a high five. It can be a conversation. It can be doing an activity. It can be you're surrounded by things and people or, you know, the, the nouns or the verbs all the time and the options all the time to be able to raise your awareness that you're surrounded by blips that are not going to last and they're not meant to. We complain about our kids being too loud when they're laughing or we complain about like, you know, oh, well, it's too hot outside. It's like you have a beautiful day out. What are you talking about? Like do something fun and play with the water. Like we're surrounded all of the time with blips that are not going to happen. In fact, Doc, you and I are in one right now. I know. I was going to say, I'm feeling happy now because you and I are having fun together. <laughs> We're in a blip right now. And this day, right now, it is 7-26-23. This day will never, ever, ever, ever happen again. It will, this day, time will never happen. This is the only one. And I get to have this time with you right now. I'm in a blip at this very moment. And if I have the awareness that I'm in one, it makes me appreciate the frailty and the very temporary nature that it is not supposed to last forever. And that's right. what makes it so beautiful is we think it's supposed to always be, but by definition, blips are temporary. So that means by like, I'm agreeing now with you, the good is not as good without the bad, but if you know what to look for, you can always find the good. Certainly more than most people recognize. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it's funny that you mentioned Arthur Brooks. I wrote him a note. <laughs> yeah. You told him to and you're like wrong, Arthur. No, I said, Arthur, <laughs> would you consider the idea that what you're promoting isn't real? <laughs> Look at you. That's my dude, Dr. Dr. Dana Saperstein. That's my guy. Yeah, think, well, would you consider maybe changing your definition so that <laughs> people can actually achieve what you're asking them to? That's, Look at you. I'm liking you more and more, man. Look at you. You are. I got, I got no response. <laughs> He's. He, he, if we if we ever get this out there to him, if somebody sends this to Arthur, he's going to be like these motherfuckers. <laughs> he's gonna... <laughs> yeah, because he makes a lot of money selling happy books. <laughs> I have one of them. I was like, what is he talking about? <laughs> so I was like, uh, I had to challenge his definition that it was, uh, it was enjoyment, it was satisfaction, and it was purpose. And while those may be in there, they're too subjective for people to grasp onto. And you got to take an entire semester to figure out what you're even getting after it's too complicated for people to find happiness. And seriously, it's everywhere. It can be, I love this, this container. It keeps my, my drinks. I love raisins and they're right here, but these will be gone when I'm done eating them. They're good, but they'll be gone. Like we're surrounded all the time by these beautiful things. It could be pet your dog. You're, you got a dog. Like, like what a you, you're, you're in blips. They won't be there forever. Neither will we. And it's beautiful, the time that we have together. If you don't see it, though, you're going to turn your blessings into curses. And you'll say that the things that are good aren't good enough because your filters that you have and the belief systems you operate under are just turning all of your good things bad. And the belief systems are at the core, which I do want to get to a core belief that you say everything is connected to fear. And I do want to get into that a little bit because I don't know if I completely see all of it, but I do see Parts okay. of it. Well, do you mind if I just comment really quickly on what you're saying? Oh, yeah, please. I think it's incredibly important. What I have found more than anything, more than anything, is that what determines the course of a person's life is how they feel about themselves deep down inside. And I know that sounds rather simplistic, but I can't even tell you how many people I meet that mess up the goodness in their life because they don't believe they deserve the goodness that comes their way because of how much shame and uh, 
um, and mistreatment or neglect that they've suffered as children. You're, so part of what I, I'm sorry, go ahead. You're correct, Amundo. And I also, I know that people don't I often grasp the power of the simplicity of what we say because the simplicity is where the true brilliance is. But this is one of those things where you just set a sentence in 5D and people can only see in 3D. And so they're like, I don't, they're like, oh, okay, well, that's pretty simple. It's like, go in the layers and you're going to realize your entire core belief system is the filters that you see the planet in. And all of the things are going to be no different than a rose colored glasses statement where you can only see everything a certain way, where all the red flags just look like party flags. And you're not going to notice that you're actually in a world where you're creating your own belief systems around everything because we add them to them. Everyone's racist if you're racist. Everyone's sexist if you're sexist. Everyone's, you know, stupid if you believe everyone's dumber than you. The way we look at the world becomes the world. Well, and that's an extension of how you feel about yourself, depending on how you consider reality. I think that what you feel is real, and I think that you were given a brain to decide what to do about how you feel, yeah. not the other way. Which then gets into the one, this is, I love, I love hanging with you already, which then gets into, well, then what is truth? Well, I, th- I think that reality shifts on a moment-to-moment basis, and that's a frightening concept because it means that, that without faith, it's really hard to feel safe. And then fear comes into the picture and runs your life most of the time. You know, if you think about how most relationships are run, they're run by fear, whether it's a business or a personal relationship. You know, if you work in a business, you're scared you're going to get fired if you make a mistake. If you're in a relationship, you're afraid you're going to get rejected if you appear to be foolish or or whatever it might be. And and, um, most people are brought up to change who they are as children because who they are is inherently not accepted by their family. And it doesn't mean your family doesn't love you. It's just that they're a way of living in the world may be contrary to your nature and your nature may be to be a really deeply feeling, really sensitive person. And uh, that creates a whole another level of, uh, of pain and suffering. If you're a very sensitive person, by nature. correct Amundo, Cause it goes against your warrior type. Some people are heart side warriors and they're taught they have to be thought or body side warriors. And it's like, hold on a second, follow that intuition of yours, follow your right. instincts. It's beautiful what you have, but if you suppress that, that turns into a whole nother expression. But I'm going to get back then that then without faith, you said we have to have faith. But does faith require evidence in order to become a belief? Well, if you're a cynical person like me, the answer is yes. I love it. I'm a hard sell. <laughs> but, then, but then how can I say that I'm spiritual if I can't see spirits? Well, because um, I have experiences every single day that reinforce that my faith is well placed. But that's because I live with the constant need that I'm willing to uh, to be honest about that. I need reassurance. Wow. I can't live without that. I don't want to live without it. I want to feel that connection all the time. I want to feel like I'm not going through life on a spiritual level by myself. And that I have really and truly completely surrendered, not to give up my free will, but to recognize that I'm so much stronger in that connection than I would be trying to go through life on my own. Now that's the correct answer. I have the same answer that you do. I found that too. But does faith then at that point saying I surrender to something more to me and it makes me feel stronger. Does that require evidence in order to be true? To me it does. And now what's the evidence? Because I can't see it. Well, I can see it and feel it on a fairly regular basis. That doesn't sound very cynical, doc. It doesn't sound cynical at all. (laughs) Well, you want to give you, you want me to give you a couple examples? Well, that would be it. Now, if the examples are feeling and I can't see them, then I won't be yes. able. To, then I won't be able to measure that because then how do I be able to have evidence? Well, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. When I was 45, which is 20 some odd years ago or more, uh, I went to go surfing with my friends, and I got to the beach before they got there. And um, I don't know how much you know about surfing, but when the waves are perfect and there's nobody around, that's like pure grade heroin for free. Okay. Right. So I get to the beach and I'm standing there and the waves are stunningly perfect. It's a beautiful January day in California with the sun shining. And and I'm standing there looking at the waves, getting ready to put my wetsuit and go surfing. And I start hearing this voice in my head screaming at me at the top of my lungs. Don't go in the water by yourself. And I'm thinking to myself, screw that. You know, this is like how often do you get here when there's nobody around 
It's absolutely perfect. The waves are stunning. My friends will be here soon. I can go, but I can't even tell you how loud that warning was. It was really truly like somebody was standing next to me screaming, don't go in the water by yourself. So after getting hammered for about 10 minutes, I thought, okay, I'll wait. So I waited about 20 minutes. My friends and I were all together. We put our wetsuits on, paddle out in the water. 10 minutes later, I have what would have been a fatal heart attack in the water. Mm. So I would have died if I didn't listen to that voice, for sure, because I barely survived anyway, despite the fact that my friends were there. Uh, and I live with heart damage as a result of it. But I'm only here because I listened to that voice. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did because yeah. I'm enjoying this conversation. So I'm, I'm, glad, yeah, I'm sure you. I'm sure I'm selfishly enjoying hanging out with you. <laughs> so I'm glad you listened just, to that voice. <laughs> I've had many experiences similar, maybe not quite as dramatic, but I've almost died four times in my life already, and only through, in my mind, the grace of God, I'm still here. Well, those are so, those are more likely near life experiences. Look at you, yes, living in, living yeah. to the fullest. That just woke you up. <laughs> yes. So again, and and then I have minor experiences every day mm -hmm. that now, confirm that my faith is well placed. Now this is where it's tricky because I have a lot of things too that coincide with what you're saying, but I also have guys who are repressed spirit side, and they're like, I can't connect with these stories. I can't understand right. what you're talking about. How do I find, uh -huh. I want surrender. I'm on mind body. Surrender means quit and fail. That's not what surrender means. But a spirit yeah. and, and, and heart side surrender means 10 X strength. And nobody understands right. it. If you have a, a suppressed part for that. And a lot of that does go yeah. into religion too, where like that was beat into them instead of being able to open up to. Well, isn't that why you and I are doing what we're doing is to try to help people understand right. that there are many different ways to approach life besides the traditional path. Um, yeah, that's what we're doing. We're breaking rules in this conversation, which some people are loving and some people are raging out right now. And I'm good well, either you, way. Uh, you know, I'm not in a popularity contest either. <laughs> I hope I hope they're triggered because they're finding something in them to work on. Yes. Um, and again, my wife gets mad at me a lot because if, if I love you and I care about you, I'll do anything for you. Oh, but if I don't if I don't necessarily know you or you or I don't respect you. I can give a shit what you think about me. And she gets mad at me for that. That's interesting. Why would she, is she, is she a type three? Is she like the achiever type where like, it's really important to read the room? You know, she's an angel. She was a hospice nurse for most of her career, okay. but she was also brought in a brought up in a family where external validation is more important than internal yeah. knowing yourself. Yeah. So she's done a lot of work to get to a place to, you know, love herself but those that kind of training is hard to disconnect from. The, the achiever type, especially, is really difficult to crack through because emotions get in the way of progress. Yeah, but when you're brought up in a Jewish family, there's an unhealthy sense of entitlement. That, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I hear what you did there. That can often be I see part of the equation. I see what you did, so father-in-law. I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, so learning some humility. <laughs> <laughs> Did we just display like heavy ego and like be humble, stupid? <laughs> that's no, that's that's tough. It's tough. My girl has the same thing, but very, very different. Like, in, and she studies Enneagrams, and so she's certified <clears throat> through that. Uh, but she's a type three, the achiever type. And that's yeah. very like even it's it's ironic because it's on the heart side for the external validation. But it uh, it's the one on the heart side that represses the heart in order to operate. And so right. it's very interesting that they, re they need and crave the validation of their achievements because being a champion or being the best or, or winning is so important because that's how you get love, even though it's actually a block from love. It's yes. ironic. It's a very tough I curse to break. Yep. I just got really lucky that I was taught not to really care that much about what people think of me. Have you ever done your Enneagram doc? Are you a type eight or what? And, you know, I don't really know how to answer that question because <laughs> I, 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 I never really explored that. It's, those it's, concepts. it's a great tool. So, you know, Myers-Briggs is how we operate, yeah. you know, uh -huh. but the Enneagram sure. is why we do what we do. And so it's right. a neat tool. Is it gospel? Of course not. But it's a cool tool to kind of go, there's a guide for how people can personality types operate. So there's nine different right. ones on there, but 
Have fun with it because the way you speak, you speak like me, where I break the rules, I push the limits, I challenge everybody, I find a better way, and I don't give a fuck what you say. These are type eights. Well, you and I are brothers from different mothers. That's sure. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I love it. I think this is great. And uh, yeah, I actually been been working on that word truth before we got into the faith aspect, because I did find the same thing. I want to share something with you in a minute that you're going to love, because okay. um, I also I was repressed spirit side and I've opened up my heart recently within this year to like I didn't realize there was so much repression there. Now, before this, my warrior side, my mind side, my spirit side are like fucking fear. I got you smoked. You I don't I don't care. I jumped out of planes. I'll fight anything. I'm not worried about any of that stuff. I'm like, where's the fear at? Even when I did my own, uh, I was uh, taking psilocybin, and I'm expecting to have a, a dance with the devil today. I'm like, bring them. I've broken my, my generational curses. I've fought through every battle that I can think of. I've beaten every part of me that's all beaten down. I'm like, I feel ready. Let's have dinner with the devil. Let's go ahead and do this. What happens when you're doing something like that is what it does is it opens up the thing that you need. They call psilocybin the teacher. And I'm like, I'm ready to go in. Let's have us a conversation with the demon. Let's go. Which, which battle do I still got to go into? I'm ready. And what it did was open my heart. My heart was the side that all the pieces I was afraid of was in. In fact, I have a fight mechanism for almost all systems except for love. And that's a fight system. Everything in there is run away. And I've done this my whole life with even healthy relationships. I was out. Even the slightest hint of a rumor would have me a smoke silhouette. And so right. I was like, wait, what's in here? Heart side had a bunch of repressed fears. My body side, if my girl's like, I'm leaving you, I'll be like, I'll pack your shit right now. I'll see you. I'll be gone in a week. See ya. My heart side is, don't leave me, babe. I would miss you like crazy. This part of me that was repressed, and I heard you talk about most men where we repress that and we shoot it into anger, I have found the same thing, you know, which also did go into the shame stack, which we'll get into too, because guys shame and women blame is one thing I've also found when I work with both groups. They start off and we have to break these curses right away. Like, hey, 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 that's not the group for that. But what I found was that part of me that was closed off, that had the fears, was in my heart side. My mind can rationalize. My body has sure. no fear. Let's go in and do the action. And my faith says I can handle all things. God's with me. I got it. Right. My heart side is terrified. I didn't enter child work. I'm like, what are you talking about? There's no kids in the gym. There's no kids in the library. No kids in the church. What are you talking about? Yeah. The heart side. And I'm like, damn, there's a little kid in there that no one wanted to play with. There's a little kid in here who's got to hide his bruises when he goes to school. There's a little kid in here that's all messed up. And nobody's loving him. There's a little kid in here who's been left by everybody. There's a little kid in yep. here who's never been protected. There's a little kid in here. That's a little guy. But then there's also the romantic who is just the most depressed part of me I've ever found. The guy who's been broken hearted over and over and, been, and just abused, you know, by, by woman after woman, which made me then lower my appreciation for women because they've done yeah. the most damage to me. Sure. And I was like, damn, look at what's in here. This whole section is chaos. Here, I found this box. I was like, what's in this box? And it's just a bunch of shattered pieces. I'm like, what is this? I'm like, that's your heart, dude. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> this is all busted up in here. And there's a ton of fear in this area. So before, I would have challenged. There ain't no fear in this thing. Bring it on. Fear of death, I'm not afraid of dying. Fear of being alone, I'm not afraid of being alone. I'm, I love it. I love my alone time. Fear of whatever. Give me the fear. Like fear of jumping out of a plane, I jumped out of a plane. I've done it. Let's go do some stuff. Let's go get in this, go, go in the jungle. I've been in the jungle. Let's go do stuff. Right. But then it started getting into the heart side, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that like this area is not equipped. This area does not have the defenses. The armor is not strong here. This dude, this broken hearted romantic, cannot take a hit. He is not he's my Shakespeare in here. And this guy is tragic. Yeah. So then I started finding fear pieces. So I would have challenged fear is, is at the core of how we make our decisions. I'm like, I don't think that's true until I just cracked the shell on this side. And then I'm like, well, maybe doc. Maybe. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a scary recognition because the only way out of the pain is by facing the fear or, and by, and instead of avoiding the pain by diving into it and working your way through it. 
that takes a lot of courage in my opinion and fear, no hates, no, fear hates courage i have a theory that uh fear well all of them actually because i write about fear doubt um excuses distractions denial depression anger i get in all of them i beat them all i'll show you i got strategies you'll love it but anyways when it comes to any of these they come in and they kill their kryptonite right away and courage hope faith right away it goes it beelines right for those to, to evict those guys because if you have too much of that then fear can't win because fear hates courage and what is right. courage courage is looking at something that's bigger or scarier and saying well i'm gonna do it anyways now yeah. you know this may hurt this may not work in my favor but i'm still gonna do it now the hard part is is that's the same definition for stupidity and that's why life is really hard <laughs> <laughs> it looks the same. So it's hard to say, is this courageous or is this stupid? It looks it's thin line on that one. So that, yeah. that's why life is hard. But in, in, in any cases, here we are. I know if I face something that's scary, and this is why it's interesting to me that people try and stay in their comfort zone, because if I also ask you, when have you been the most proud of yourself for doing something? What is something that you've done that you've been the most proud of? And it's almost always something difficult or frightening or intimidating, you know, give a speech in front of thousands of people or like do something that like this, I could get rejected. This could be embarrassing. This could be, you know, a really bad idea. I'm going to ask her out and she's going to tell me, go fuck myself. And then I will. Yep. Then, then, so you're like, oh man, this is, this is tough. And then you go and do that thing and you're like, man, that worked out. I feel really great. I'm glad I did that. The most yeah. proud you ever been when you, you face something that scares you. So why is it so funny that we paralyze ourselves from feeling so damn good? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the things that we focus on that scare us come from the outside. Interesting. Like danger? Or do you just mean like somebody will just do something that we don't like? Well, I mean, if you think about jumping out of a plane. Well, that's um, dangerous for sure. Yeah. And it's, it's something you're doing on the outside. Let's um, go with the obvious ones, like embarrassment. Okay. Well, embarrassment has to do with how you feel about yourself, again, deep down inside. And the fact that you have questions about your value and that you're assuming that other people are judging you in a way that feels scary to you because what if they don't like you or don't love you or don't want to have anything to do with you? Yeah, what if? What if? That would really hurt if you, if you value that person. Yeah, if you don't value yourself and you don't know your lines. I'm with you. We do five weeks in the warrior's way of just know thyself. Just yeah. tearing in, what are your values? What are your strengths? What are your non-negotiables? What's your personality type? Uh, you know, what is your default program? How high is your awareness for yourself? Like, what are your strengths and, and your operation systems? How well do you actually know you? If I ask somebody, what's your top two values? People will be like, I don't know. I'm like, yeah, most people don't. How are you supposed right. to create a healthy boundary around things you don't know? Well, do you ask people why they're here? on earth like what the purpose of their life i don't is, get at least. I, I don't get into purpose until far later because even asking what do you want is a question most people can't answer i actually uh -huh. moved what do you want until i think it's section 12 uh the reason uh -huh. why is because um if you don't know thyself and you don't know what you have to battle or what you have like is your inventory so far how are you supposed to have a direction on what it is that you want if you don't even know what's wrong or what you don't have because if you think about the programming that you mentioned earlier well, when were we not told what we're supposed to do? Parents, teachers, coaches, bosses, spouses, you name it. You, you, they go in the military, commanding officers, and they're told when to wake up, when to eat, when to shit, when to sleep. Like, when are you not told what to do? And so well, then, then you go, well, what do you want? Then take into account, you got to take care of other people. If you become a, a spouse or you become a parent, well, then everything is, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And then when does it come into like, all right, your turn. What do you want? And you're like, I don't think I've had a dream. Actually, my whole life, ever since I, they, they told me what I'm supposed to do. I told me I have to do this and I have to do that and stay here and do that thing and help them and fix this. I don't actually know what I want. You know, one of the ways I help people kind of understand that concept is that you have a particular version of love that you're capable of expressing to the world. And it's very unique to you. So what if one of the reasons that you're on earth is to show the world what Rick's version of love looks like? And that if you go through life with that as a goal is to show the people that you come in contact with what your version of love looks like. 
it has a tendency to help people feel a lot better about the way that they go through life. Because it's not about them having something wrong with them or, or all of that stuff, but really, most people are so lonely and are so dying for love and and, uh, and attention. And so if you go through life just doing the best you can to show what love looks like, it takes a lot of pressure off who you are as a person. I know it's not a magic answer, but I think it does help a great deal to, look, to shift away from making things super complicated to looking at it from a more simplistic picture. Because, you know, you're good at showing your love. Whether you realize it or not, you're a very loving person and you show it very readily, whether you're aware of it. Oh, I'm highly aware. I do it on purpose. I deliberately, okay, I deli- uh, I'm throwing you love left and left and right here. So, I feel it. But I, I'm actually, yeah, this is actually a powerful thing you just said. Um, and I wrote it down and help me reword it if I wrote it right. What does your version of love look what like? Love what does your like, version yeah. of love look like? And because Daniel's version is different than Rich's version. Correct. But it doesn't mean it's not any good. And I, I have a video. We just we got a million views just this week on like you know I, I said uh, two most dangerous love languages, and there's only there's okay. two of them that required the most reciprocity, and so that's the point of it. And people are like, oh no, I have the worst ones. I'm like, no, just be aware of the people you're with if you guys can reciprocate because it doesn't right. hurt if these two don't don't work. And so I don't know if you've seen this, but I did the example where it's like if if I bought you a present, like hey, I got you a shirt, check it out, doc. And you're like, oh, damn it, now i got to go buy you a shirt. I'm like, no, we don't. We're good. You don't have to go buy me anything. This is just a gift. That's how I'm yeah. showing you love. We don't have to do anything there for you to go buy me a gift, you know? And uh, yeah. if I was like, um, oh, crap, man, you're, you got a flat tire? I got you. I'm good at tires. I've been a mechanic for a long time, and I pop that off, and I fix a tire in seconds. I'm like, good to go, Doc. Happy to help you. And you're like, all right, let's go fix your tire. I'm like, you don't got to fix my tire. It's good. And you're like, no, I got to do something. Now I got to keep score here and I got to go do that. We're like, no, we don't. This act of service was happily done by me. It's how I show love. You don't have to go do an act of service right away. We're good. Mm-hmm. We don't have to do that. Uh, quality right. time gets a little more subjective because what that means for people, and that can be more re- reciprocity, but also some people just be like, you know, if your wife is reading a book and you're watching a, a podcast or something, and you're like, we're both there together and I love her and she loves me. We don't have to be on top of each other in order to be like spending time. We're good. That's a different definition. Doesn't always require somebody to do something. Just being can be enough. But then if we get into somebody saying like, Hey babe, I really love you. And they go, Oh, that's nice. (laughs) You're like, Oh shit. That guy kind of sucks. You know, if, if they're like, you're one of the most important people to me and they're like, okay, well you're, you're okay. (laughs) <laughs> like it, it, it's it's one of those things where you can hurt someone's feelings with just the rest of the reciprocation of how that works and it, imagine this right if if you're like hey good to meet you doc and i go to sh- like you, you go to like reach for my hand i'm like get out of here yeah you're like oh you that's disrespect immediately or if a lover is like hey i want to hold hands with you and they're like i don't want to hold hands with you you're like hmm This doesn't even have to be intimacy because, of course, people always speak in extremes. Well, every time I touch you doesn't mean you have to have sex. It's like, stop it. Even if they just want to hold hands, it's still a rejection. Right. And so I said these two, like, like touch without reciprocity can hurt immediately. And if this is the main way that they show love and affection and it's hard rejected, it hurts. It matters. It matters to that person a lot. And the same thing with words, you know, and if you use these words and people want to get into the. Uh, being extremely, um, they, they want to get into the semantics of like, well, that word is not exactly what Gary Chapman was meaning in his book. And I'm like, listen, please, you understand that these words can sting. And if you use them a certain way, they do damage. And if somebody right. is opening up vulnerably saying, I appreciate you so much, and they go like, I don't care about you, like it hurts right away. And so those are the reasons that I put it out there. How do you, what's their version of showing love? And I, I just want to know, like, all right, now that you've heard what the video is, what's your thoughts? You're like, Gary Chapman's an idiot. We're going for Arthur C. Brooks and we're going for Gary Chapman. We're going after him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Gary Chapman, I got a bunch of his books here. He's like, I, I like his stuff, but some people don't go along with it. Well, you, you know, um, Getting back to the notions of fear that we were talking about. Do you think that the, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
I'm just, I just saw you like, and we're skipping Gary Chapman. Let's go back to fear. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I'm happy to, we can talk shit if you want. <laughs> yeah, that, which is, which is fine. That's, I actually appreciate your opinion. So I, this isn't, I don't have any restrictions for you. Yeah. If you're like, well, I, I, don't, I, I don't read a ton of that kind of material to tell you the truth. Fair enough. All right. With even just, even just knowing love languages by itself and without reading anything. My, my yeah. explanation, what was your opinion? Yeah. Well, and I think it's really important that people do understand what matters. Mm -hmm. Because if we all think that our way is the way that it should be, and a lot of times people don't even realize that they believe that their way is, you know, the way that it should be, because it makes so much sense to us. And I was working with a couple earlier today, and the woman can't get enough of her boyfriend. She just wants to be with them all the time. And he needs a little bit of time to be by himself. But whenever he creates a situation where he can be by himself, she takes it as, you don't love me, you don't want to be with me. And he thinks, this woman's got a hole so deep inside of her that I can't fill it up no matter what. So with that kind of way of looking at things, it's going to create a lot of problems in the relationship, right? So part of what I tried to help them both understand is that their nervous systems are wired differently. And that they both come to the same place. They were both incredibly emotionally uh, uh, deprived as children. He learned to take care of himself by just going into his own cave and kind of tending to himself. And she just lived in deprivation and, and starvation all the time. So once they sort of came to understand that it's not personal, his need to be alone has nothing to do with not loving her. And her desire to be with him is not because she's empty and insatiable. You know, they walked away with a big smile on their face because they realized they've been really misunderstanding each other on a very deep level. And it was the fear that was running the show instead of the love that they have for each other. Yeah, I so like, I just kind of I like that you used called, that. You, you, you called it the fear of what the other person was trying to do to them because I was I was seeing the belief system shift, not necessarily even the fear. But maybe maybe I missed no, it, the part. It, it was a it was a fear that um, of not being loved or not I being see. understood. Fair enough. Yeah. And feeling and feeling like I don't matter enough because you don't want to spend every every minute with me. And the other person's like, "Well, I'm scared because no matter what I give you, it's never enough." Right. And then you said like everybody is loving like in their way. And this is why yeah. it's also interesting is because people are I do believe giving their version of like when you said what does your version of love look like. Like one yes. person is gift giving and one person is uh touch and they're going like, uh -huh. Hey, but I like presents and Hey, I like hugs. Right. And like your hugs oh. are annoying the shit out of me right now. Give me a present. <laughs> and you're like, I don't want to buy you a present cause I want a hug. And you're like, your love exactly. sucks. No, your love sucks. You suck at love. No, you suck at love. Why don't you give me a fucking hug? I don't want to give you a fucking hug anymore. Like it's one of those That's things. And it's like, yeah. wait a second, wait a second. You're both just loving in your best way, but not understanding that's still their love. But their love isn't like your love, so you then judge their love to be incorrect love, to shame yeah. their love, so they don't feel like they're doing love unless they do it your way. And then it just turns well, into who's was, the meanest. Well, that's what I was trying to help them see, is that it was a big misunderstanding. They both actually really love each other. Yeah. And that's yeah. very, very clear to me. It's not codependent. Uh, it's have a gentle approach when you say, "Hey, baby, I love you," but give me give me a minute here. Instead of going, "Get off me, you needy bitch," like it's different. <laughs> well, and, and you know, when people come in my office as a couple, as an example, and they sit at opposite ends of the couch. Oh no! You know, that's a really different form of expression than if they sit right next to each other and uh, are really touching each other the whole time we're speaking. Agreed. I, I don't know that people even realize how either together or separate, they keep themselves from the people that they love. Good observation and correct. Well played. Well played, Doc. All right. Well, now, just, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just praising you. Yeah, good observation. I see the same thing. I'm with you. Hey, guys, Thank you. I, here's one thing, too. I'll I got a belief system one. I'm not going to call names out, but I did love this couple. They're, they're fantastic. And so I was working with this couple, and – uh he felt like really disconnected from her because that post coital, they just had some good sex and she was like, damn, babe. And she went to high five him. <laughs> and he was like, you seriously, you're going to, after all that, you're going to high five? Really? Like, 
this is so disrespectful. This is so uncool. Like after that, I just get a high five. That's what I get. And it was funny because he felt like pissed about this. They argued about it. Like it was a big deal. And then when I was talking to him and, and she was like, yeah, I, I went to go high five him. And he got really upset. He's like, yeah, it's super disrespectful. How uncool to do that. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. You got the high five, bro. <laughs> and he was like, he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, she gave you the high five. Get that high five, dude. He's like, really? I was like, you got your, you, whatever you did. I don't know if you were partying from the back real hard or whatever, but you got the high five, dude. <laughs> yeah, I guess I did get the high five. I was like, you get you that high five, brother. And he was like, Shit, yeah, you know what? Maybe I do want to get some more high fives. And she's like, see? I was like, yeah, dude, get you a high five. Fist bump that thing too, man. Top gun that thing. I don't care. He's like, yeah, you know what? Next time we're getting me a high five. I was like, yeah, you are, Tiger. Go get him. <laughs> like, but that turned it just that one shift where I was like, well, you got the high five. That's awesome, dude. He's like, it is. <laughs> like, I thought it was bad. I was like, no, high five is badass. All I did was shift his belief system to right. take something that was like, that hurt my feelings into like, that's actually what I'm searching for, for feeling awesome now. It's just, it's, it's amazing how much we change the filter that we see the world with. And especially with fear you change it and you go like presence in the present, for example. I know that this is something you believe in too. Like, hold on a second. You're sitting here trembling. You're sitting here doing all the stuff. And I'm worried there's a lion in the damn house. But let's look around for a second. That's in here. And there is no lion. Now I'm with you. Danger is different than fear. Because fear, I, I do not believe that fear is real. I, f I believe this is potential outcomes that usually don't happen. Now, danger is different. If there's an intruder, that's different than me being worried about an intruder that's not there. Two different things. Danger is different from fear. That's at least my opinion. So whenever I'm fighting something in the future, the same thing as Lao Tzu, where he says anxiety is in the future, depression is in the past, and peace is in the present. I'm like, I have presence in the presence. Is the thing that you're afraid of happening? Let's at least start there. Okay. And then I'm, like, sure. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm afraid of, you know, my girl breaking up with me. You're like, is she breaking up with you? Well, no. Then why are, why are we worried? It's not happening. That's not a thing to worry about right now. We don't have to plan for the worst when she's still happily with you. So what are we doing? Isn't this... But what if that person has a history of being broken up with and they assume that the yeah. past is a reflection of the future? My real answer on this one is you may have to do some healing on your own before you give somebody shattered pieces of a heart that you don't even respect and love and expect them to love it. Exactly. You know, in yeah. which case, if you're not married, because then we have to heal together. But if you're like, listen, don't don't give yourself <clears throat> uh, don't put yourself in a position where I don't like myself. I don't love myself. And yet somebody else is supposed to unconditionally love me when I can't do it myself. Hold on. A, hold on a second. You're expecting. In fact, you're, you're demanding somebody do something for you that you won't even do for yourself. In fact, right. you don't even like yourself. The, your self-talk is nasty. I heard you say, too, like if, if somebody talked to you the way that you talk to you, you'd be in prison. I heard you yes. say it. I was like, yeah, that's what people do. Like it, it, uh -huh. it, the self-talk that happens inside of people, like you would not tolerate that from anybody. And yet this is on loop in our heads all day long. Mm -hmm. If you've got yeah. that, that loop where you, I, I, I'm just so you know, I'm not challenging anything in a way that I totally disagree or we'd stay on that topic. I'm agreeing with you consistently here where if you don't know thyself, and you don't like or even love yourself in any way, shape, or form, yet have an expectation that others should be doing it, it is not them, because you don't even like you. How are they supposed right. to just unconditionally love you? It's not possible. Can't happen. And yet here we are with a series of expectations that they should be doing what I said, even though I won't do it myself. Well, and again, that's why I teach people the best of my ability focus on the inside, not that the outside doesn't matter, but if you recognize that most of what happens, you're teaching people, right? If I don't love myself, I'm teaching you not to love me. If I'm not faithful to myself, why will you be faithful to me? 
And I don't, and I say that to people and I say, well, I'm not unfaithful to myself. I'm not having an affair with, you know, somebody else. Uh, I said, well, that's not exactly true. If you're, if you doubt yourself and you're constantly telling yourself you suck, you're not being faithful to yourself. Yeah, so yeah. how can you expect the person you're in a relationship with to, to uh, treat you with the kind of respect that you won't even, like you say, you won't give yourself. You wouldn't even be friends with you the way you talk to yourself. <laughs> you wouldn't you'd even you wouldn't even hang out with you right. yeah it's a good point all right i want to get in i'm gonna i'm gonna jump us over into just another fear topic Ooh. all right now i work with men mostly like i had women's groups i am phasing my women out and referring out my women to other um, women experts now okay um with my men and my women though i found some commonalities with fear and i found some commonalities with the systems for protecting themselves I'd like to hear your opinion before I just start throwing my, my stuff out there. Men, so, most common fears. Women, most common fears. Not everybody, just the most common. Give me the big groups. Well, I think that women are brought up to be really fearful of their appearance. Fear of the burden of beauty. Correct. Okay. Right. So, look, I have never bought a pair of pants and looked at my butt in the mirror. Yeah. It wouldn't even occur to me to do that. Until tomorrow. Well, <laughs> yeah. even then, at my age, there's no butt left anyway, so there's oh, nothing man. to look at. Right? <laughs> but I think that women are conditioned to uh, to be very self-conscious about their appearance. Right? And when I think, and again, I've gotten in trouble by saying this, but I think that a lot of times when women first meet each other, they check each other out physically, especially whose breasts are bigger and whose butt is smaller. Well, it used to General, be smaller. Now it's bigger butts. Yeah, whatever it might be, but it's whatever, but it's the, whatever the physical people. trends are. Who's got the longest right. eyelashes now? Yeah, and <laughs> when men get together, generally speaking, we're conditioned to be worried about how big our penises are, but it's not we'll really do that. very. We don't. Right? I never. Big. Dana, this is me going like, hey, Doc, good to meet you. So six, seven, eight, where are you at here? Yeah. What do we do? We, we, yeah. It's never been a thing. No, the penis sizes, what do you do for a living? Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Oh, so, look, I just jumped ahead. My, I'll mute myself, man. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, men are conditioned to believe that their value is based on performance. Mm -hmm. And so that's why men always ask each other, you know, right off the bat, how much money do you make in a disguised kind of a way? And then but you put the person in a category. I would say that the way that men and women express their fears, and this is a huge generalization, are a little bit different. Women are taught to take their fear out on themselves by being self-critical and rejected. Men are taught to take their fear out on other people by being uh, cruel and disrespectful to other people. Now, big generalization, because I know a lot of men criticize themselves, and some women can be aggressive in the terms of how they deal with their fear. But most women are made to feel ashamed of the idea that they would express their fear by being aggressive towards somebody else. And most men are encouraged to do it because it's a sign of strength and, uh, and uh, being an alpha male. Well, I, well I, I did a whole thing on anger and how if you look at the different ways that we would display um, the way that we would cope with situations, especially we don't have control, things are not going well. And like, look at what are the different ways that I can handle it. So you've got, um, you know, your denial <laughs> suppression system. So we could just shut it all down. I don't want to uh, push it down. We can only do that for so long. We can only do that because right. denying anything is just, you don't get noticed. It's not a very good system. We can try and pretend to be stoic all the time, but it doesn't always work out because there's a humanity that does come out. So the, the, the suppression system can only go for so long. You've got negotiators and this is going to get into your bargaining systems. And this is where people are going to be like trying to control conversations and try to people please. They'll try to sacrifice for peace. They'll get into like, what do I got to do to make it so this is mediated and okay? Uh, you've got this aspect of the negotiator. But then you start getting into your fight responses. And then you got your depression or your, your shutdown responses, your freeze. And so then you go, like, well, which ones of these actually start working for like getting attention, especially being a young man? I don't have status yet. I don't have achievement yet. You know, whether you be in high school or the college, you're not sitting out riding your career yet. You already know when you are going for, like, if you're going in for, for your degree, you don't have a thriving business yet. I'm right. only potential. 
I'm not actually doing it yet. So now I have to measure myself in what way, shape, or form when women will have natural beauty when they're younger and guys have low status when we're younger. You know, it's not until we start building status where there's at least a point where it balances out for beauty to status, but then guys continue status and building and beauty fades and then it starts getting a little more complicated. But back to what my point is, well, which way would look the most confident, especially if you're a young man then? Well, suppression leads to expression, and so I can only push it down until it comes out in one way, shape, or form. And have you ever seen anybody just blast, ugly, cry guy all over their girl? Let's just say how much that dude's getting not laid tonight, because (laughs) that's not sexy. In fact, I even learned from girls when I was really young, and I you know, started cracking through my abuse and cracking through what happened in my life. I remember calling even a girlfriend at 15 going, oh, my God, like, I noticed that my stuff is very different than everybody else's stuff. And I was abused and I had really tough issues and I was working through them crying on the phone like, oh, shit, I now realize the reality of my existence. This is not yeah. normal. This was not how everybody else's was. I'm like, oh, my God. And I remember crying on the phone and she's like, "Uh, okay, broke up with me the next day. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I mean, no, no blame to her. She's not a therapist. She hasn't, she's not supposed to deal with that. But as far as at that age, I learned very quickly crying at a girl means she just leaves. And I was also in Sparta. So don't remember, remember if I cried at my dad, (laughs) I don't know why you're crying. So I'm just going to give you a reason. So I understand it better, which is a right. Brilliant notion, by the way. If I don't know why you're crying, I'll just beat the shit out of you, so at least I get it. Right. (laughs) That's funny. So we learn crying doesn't work. And we also learn that being overly ridiculous like a clown doesn't work either. You can't be too ridiculous. (laughs) Can't do that because that's not sexy. It doesn't work for you. But being loud, mean, aggressive, it still gives it the illusion or the false confidence of, He knows what he wants. He won't be, he can protect me because he's so tough. It's a still a a false sense of like my aggression or my anger can still be, oh, he he must be showing signs of strength, signs of of, of all this aptitude. He's, He's got it. He's a bad boy. He won't be controlled. So I know I'll be safe with him, which is ironic thinking that this shell or this defense system that I've created to make it so I can appear to be much tougher than I am is really just a mask for my true fear, which is my real feelings. That is definitely very much the case. When I was a little kid, I got sexually abused as a four-year-old. Mm. Uh, I went to the hospital to have surgery, and um, the man, that the orderly in the hospital that had sexually abused me, told me he was going to kill me if I told anybody. He was the guy that wheeled me in uh, to the upper room the next morning, so when they were anesthetizing me, I thought they were killing me. Oh my so God. I went under anesthesia screaming, I won't tell, I won't tell. And it wasn't until I was in my 30s that I actually recalled being sexually abused. Jeez. Um, It was crazy. But a bunch of other stuff happened after that that, you know, left me in a place by the time I was six or seven years old. I just fought constantly. Mm -hmm. I was, I was a, I don't know how it happened, but I was like a major bully as a little kid. Fought everybody all the time until I got to junior high and discovered drugs. And then I just pushed it all away. Really? So uh, I'm, very, I'm very familiar with the pattern of suppression and that turning that into symptoms of, uh, you know, when you push your feelings down, they come out in the form of anxiety, depression, self-hate, all that other rage, stuff, rage. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I got tired of hurting other people. It made me feel bad. So I just started to go after myself. And uh, luckily my parents were uh, aware of the fact that their son was miserable. And so they convinced me to get into therapy at a relatively long age. Otherwise, I'm not sure I would have survived. Yeah, that's brutal, man. Damn. But oh. it also, in a certain way, has equipped me to be able to help people that have had the worst things that you could imagine happen because uh, as a result of healing my trauma, it allows me to be present to other people's trauma without being triggered by their sure. pain. No, I'm, I'm with you. I go in, I'm go. i with you. We can go into hell. I'll go in. I'm not scared of that shit. Sure. I'll go yeah. in. But damn, I'm just thinking of an orderly, like, messing with a four-year-old little boy. What the fuck? Well, when I was five, I lived in Brazil, and there was a revolution there. I looked out the window and watched soldiers killing people. So 
it didn't stop with sexual abuse. It was a crazy childhood. Jeez. Yeah. Damn. A little kid. And, and like, man, it's, it's, it's brutal what a lot of kids go through. Man, just think about it. you being a four year old little kid. Like, you got nothing. I'm like, yeah. what's wrong with this dude to be like, I want to hurt this little baby, I want this little kid? Well, because of what I do for a living, I know that people get sexually abused in every aspect of the world. Yeah. Uh, I've worked with people that have been abused by mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and aunts and uncles and teachers and clergy, any and all forms of. It's, Life. it's remarkable how insanely common that is. Six like, out of ten men and seven out of ten women have something sexual happen to them. It's crazy common. That is so, that's a wild number. But I know that, like, the more women that I talk to, it's like, it's it's so common. Really common. And, and, and again, that, that statistic ranges from, you know, fondling to rape. Yeah. Um, and I think that the men are underreported, if you want to know my opinion, because I okay. think a lot of men are ashamed to admit it. Uh, uh, well, well, the women are ashamed to admit it, right? Is that what you meant? Well, yes, but it's more acceptable for a woman to admit sexual abuse than a man. Oh, I, th- I see what you mean. If a guy is sexually abused, I see what yeah. you mean. I thought yeah. you meant like, you know, if a guy rapes, he's not reporting it. I'm like, I don't think that's going to happen as often. No, no, but no, 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 I'm sorry. You uh, meant if a, if a guy yeah. is, is molested or raped, they yeah. won't report it as often. When I tell people what happened to me, I see the look of alarm on people's faces and mm. in a much different way than I would imagine that if a woman told them the same thing. What do you mean by that? Saying, like, cause I just, well, I just think of a poor little kid either way. I don't think I, I didn't yes. have a judgment in that way. Well, um, I just think that uh, we have different standards in terms of who we see as being perpetrators and who we see as being victims. I, when I was younger, like in the 80s, I took a class on sexual abuse and I was there with 25 women and me being the only man in the room. Mm-hmm. And when I started to tell the other therapists that I had clients that were abused sexually by women, sisters or mothers or grandmothers mm-hmm. or aunts or teachers, I just about got thrown out of the seminar. What a weird... Because the women said to me, the women said to me, women don't sexually abuse. They're, they're the victims. You guys and are said, in what so, class... <laughs> This was a, a continuing education course. And mm-hmm. I said, I said to these people, what the fuck is wrong with you? Uh, I should tell all my clients that are making this shit up that, that yeah. you know, the things that happen to them are not real because women don't do that. Yeah. Cause you guys yeah. said so you guys had a subjective opinion of somebody else's experiences not being validated yet. You need to be first in line to be heard. Well, I, I all I can tell you is that I'm hoping things have changed since then. But it was an incredibly unpleasant yeah. experience. I'd be hard to pressed, be- Doc. How do you, you really think that right now they're more concerned over the the pain of men right now? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, as a leader of a men's group, these right. guys come in and go, nobody gives a shit about our feelings, and it seems valid. Well, I, look, I can't help but being a white male. I can't help it. <laughs> well, I don't even mean the skin color. I I don't have just white yeah. guys. I have all the nationalities. Sure. And yeah. so, like, but it's the same, you know, across the board is like the empathy for a man is very low, period. Right. Well, and I think that that uh, domestic abuse is way underreported in men compared to women. For sure. I think I was watching the latest statistic I saw is like, I think women are, are hitting men three times more than men hit women. But when a guy hits a woman, it matters three times more. Well, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't argue with with the the prejudice and the misunderstandings. All, all I want to do is make sure that if somebody tells you that something like that's happened to them, don't try to talk them out of it because I can't tell you how many of my clients have been shamed into submission when they have tried to tell somebody that something happened. Or, well, you know, even parents tell their kids, well, you asked for it or you did something to deserve it because nobody would do that or, um, or you know, I work this, the is this to boys or is this like to people? Well, this is. This, I mean, I, look, I just was working with a woman recently who started being raped by her father as a two-year-old, and the father still lives with the mom, and she's in her thirties, and the mom keeps saying, "How come you don't come home and visit?" And, and the and, woman and, says, "Well, because you're still living with the guy that raped me as a kid. Well, he doesn't do that anymore." And it's like, what the? F- <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> And I'm not talking about ghetto here. I'm talking about a city of no, you know, no, extreme wealth. Humans, but damn it, 
You know what I think is so, a fascinating thing? I'm, I don't want to jump it off topic, but I do want to stay on this. But it gets into one of the things I think is the most amazing for the human brain is the word justification. Like, yeah. I think it's one of the most fascinating things that a human brain can do because it can break every golden rule that you have inside of your head and yet somehow give you impunity, in fact, make you righteous. Right. It's amazing. You can be a pedophile and call yourself a great person and sleep like a baby at night, thinking that you're really, really good, even though your highest source of pleasure is absolutely decimating a baby. What the yeah. fuck? It's, well, I mean, again, I've come to understand that nobody has invented sexual abuse themselves. Usually people that are abusing others have had it happen to them. No, that's not an excuse. It's right. an explanation. Agreed. Right, because I was sexually abused. I know with a fair amount of certainty I did not do that to my children. My children are adults. They've never said anything like that's happened. I don't have any memory of abusing them in any way. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that it's possible to break the cycle if you take responsibility for it. But I'll tell you, Rick, as a professional, I've probably had maybe a handful of perpetrators step forward and beg forgiveness. And I'm talking about hundreds of people at this point. Yeah. A handful have come to beg forgiveness from their children. That's amazing. What a mess. It is a mess, and I'm sorry to be so negative. No, 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 no. I'm, we go in the fray. I'm not, This is, don't have to apologize to me. But it's like, damn, just the reality of like even those circumstances. And I, like, again, my, my heart, how does Rick show up? Like, my heart goes out to you and all these kids where it's like, damn, sure. like, well, like and, and as so as as a like uh, as our men for the warriors way mindset like we are protectors and we 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 were with Ryan Mickler and those guys were like protect provide preside like we take care of our packs we take care of our people and when we hear about little kids getting hurt you're like the protector in you is like man fuck like well hmm, my my injustice. my version of showing love to people in this regard is to make sure that if you've been sexually abused that you know that you deserve to be loved. Right. And that it wasn't your fault. Right. Don't take it out on yourself if you can help it. And do everything you can to heal and let the person that harmed you be responsible for their actions. Right. Yeah. And, and understand that, that that it's okay to receive love just because, you know, something that made you feel so hateful and ashamed of yourself has been, you know, running your life most of your life. With your hypnotherapy, because I know that I've also been, this is another reason why, like, I, I actually would like to get, I'm going to get, um, I'm going to be doing more work and being certified and going through the steps for doing my own uh, psychedelic therapy is because I'm uh -huh. watching like there's no different than your hypnotherapy is there are fast tracks to crack into the, the parts of that are these fights. And I already do versions of NLP as it is, but as yeah. far as like, I know that like, you know, even when I do those, it's a repetition that still needs to be done. Um, I do work with other guys who are masters and neurolinguistics and they're able to like help, help cut those triggers very quickly. Uh, especially people who have been in service industries, uh, veterans, first responders, like people have seen nightmares, like people's most yeah. terrible days and have yeah. to relive those memories. And like it, it can uh -huh. be done. I've even talked with, uh, work with, I send people to Dan Jarvis, who owns a company called 220, who helps first responders and veterans. Uh, but because he's like, I found that you can break PTSD. They don't call it PTSD. They call it PTS. Because yeah. he's like, it's not a disorder. We can beat it. And he's beaten it. Right. Last I looked is over 6,000 people that are like, we cut it and we, that's not in there. It's not their system anymore. And I know that uh -huh. you're in this game too. This is your field. And you've been also yeah. like mastering in this area. Say so like, it's not PTSD anymore. It's PTS. And I can help okay. you beat it. Right. And, uh, you know, honor to you for that. Cause I've had some success, but I do it more cognitively. And so I would team up happily with someone like you because I go in, underneath that layer like i'll help you keep practicing but you're like i'm gonna get underneath and we're gonna cut that root out and then keep practicing like and so right. like I, I always see value and all the other warrior types that are out there all doing this fight together and uh god where was i just going with this i was sitting here praising you all right so you know, you know rick what i would say to you is that like i said this before you have a template inside of you that knows exactly what you need to do in order to heal Mm -hmm. So my job is to, to tap into that template that lives inside of you. 
so that you can learn to trust that your unconscious mind and your higher self knows where to take you in the process of hypnosis step by step in order to release the pain in a way that is safe enough to be able to tolerate. And at the same time, I can't tell you it's not a little bit emotionally overwhelming because I tell everybody that decides to do hypnotherapy, you're going to go through a period of time where you feel very tender hearted. Yeah. It won't stop you from functioning, but you're going to be crying more than you used to and feeling like a little kid a lot of the time. Yeah. And you have to especially make sure that your partner knows that your disinterest in being sexual for a period of time is not having anything to do with them, but having to do with the fact that your body cannot discriminate between healthy sexual desire and that that comes from being perpetrated upon. Fair enough. That's, man, highest honors to you, Doc. That's such a powerful fight to go into. And like, like, like it's, it's an honor to see a warrior who fights for people this way. Like, I well, appreciate you very much. I don't think it's an accident. You and I found each other. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, it's such a big fight. And like, it, it it's, it's so frustrating um, in my heart, how often it happens to even have to be uh, a mastery that's required. And so, you know, thank you for being one of those guys who's like, I'll go into these, these nightmares and be there for these guys and actually give them the tools to break it and not just talk about their feelings about well, and you as well. You're doing the same thing, and you're you're showing love in your way. I'm showing love in my way, and it's helping people, which is the whole goal of what we've dedicated our lives to. Yeah, that's Plus good. We get to be in the ass, which is also fun. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the good stuff right there, man. It does break my heart though hearing little kids get hurt. Like that. I just don't I don't have that thing, and I don't know how to. I know that the you're right. It's it's an ex- explanation, not an excuse. But what a what a sad sad shape that people are, where they see somebody who's like vulnerable and young, and they want to hurt them for pleasure. Well, you know, it got worse with COVID. Yeah, I believe it. Because COVID scared people, and when people are more scared than usual, they act out in ways that are harmful to others. Um, my wife uh, is part of a charity in Kenya, and the village leader called her up during COVID and said, hey, uh, school's closed and all the uh, fathers and uncles are raping their daughters and, and uh, nieces now because they're so out of control that it's become epidemic in their in their village that, that young women are being sexually abused. All right, listen, just on the psychology aspect of it, I know that like the, the neurobiology for us to find our daughters attractive is yeah. like, there's, there's like, there's like a lot of sensor, sensory things in here that go like, that one is not one that you should want. Like there has to be a massive like goof up inside of somebody's like chemistry to go like, I'm going to rape my own kid. There's like a goof well, up I mean, there, right? Look, I, I hope that you don't get mad at me for saying this, but look at what Donald Trump said about his daughter. I, I actually, right. I, I'm, I'm not as huge in the politic following because I stay off. Well, the... part of, you know, part of what he said is that, you know, he finds her sexually appealing. Right. You don't say shit like that out loud when you're in a position of power. Yeah. Generally speaking, people that are like that have personality disorders, which means that they have no conscience and they have no ability to really understand that their behavior is having a negative effect on others. OK, I got, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. A gross generalization, but it, there are a lot sure. of people that commit these. Uh, um, I think I think saying my daughter is attractive and then saying I'm going to rape my daughter or rape my niece is a different thing. But I, I, mean, yes. I, 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 I guess I see where you're going. Like, no, like, because like I've got my stepdaughters. They're beautiful girls, but there's not like a sexual right. attraction to them. I can, but I can well, know they're beautiful they're, girls. Well, there's a biological imperative to not bring your genetic material into uh, your family because it creates. Um, irregularities, uh, things get weird with yeah. it. We get inbred kids, like, and so it does get yeah. goof stuff up. But this is why it's weird that out in Kenya, like, like, hey, there's a, we're shutting down the schools. It's like, well, I'd better rape my daughter. Like, or I'm gonna rape my niece. Like, what is happening? I think it's a, a lot of frustration, a lot of desperation, a lot of starvation. Um, I, I never, have, I had never been that hungry before. No, you know, I'm not. Again, I can only provide. <laughs> Explanations. The, the Fair enough. Right. There's no justification for any of it. Mm. Uh, I, you know, I personally believe that people that have sexual relations with children, you know, they don't belong on our earth. 
Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I think that that's a very different trial. That's for sure. I think the trial should be like: Is there value for somebody who finds absolute pleasure in destroying children? And usually, it's a compulsive thing because of what it is that happened to them. Not always. Some people are sociopathic by nature, and and uh, they just enjoy preying upon others. Um, but that's the the small minority compared to. Right. Yeah. What most people experience is by it's by somebody they know. It's mm-hmm. not you know the guy in the park or the whatever. It's usually by somebody that is friends with the family in some way or a member of the family. Yeah, I, and I, I, I've, this, I've seen like step brothers and stuff horrible, like but, that. Yeah, brutal things. But I would say that women are perpetrators, not as much as men, but not as small as you would think. Because I've known a lot of women who've been sexually abused and men by their mothers and by their aunts and uncle. I mean, uh, grandmothers and teachers and you know it's not one way it's also different too and like you know there's there's uh, i've seen jokes and stuff on it i know that's meant to be a joke so i've seen like joe rogan and stuff like that make jokes too right um which which i I guess a joke i took i thought it was funny the way he did his joke so no knocking on anybody on this one but when he said like the stuff with harvey weinstein with his daughter going in versus his son going in if it was harvey at weinstein and going right. like, if you sleep with me, you can be Batman. And if it was like his daughter, he'd be like, that's, uh, that's out of line. That's fucked up. Not okay. And then he's like, well, Harvey at Weinstein says if my son, you know, goes down on her or sleeps with her, then she can be Batman. He's like, you're going to be Batman. Like, you know, like, like it's yeah. one of those things where it's a joke. If it happens to a guy, it's not bad. But if yeah. it happens to a yeah. girl, it's atrocious. And it's yeah. almost that same thing too, where it's kind of like, um, you know, if a guy was like, yeah, I woke up and the, and the girl was like, she was mounting me and she was, she was starting to have sex with me. And I was like, what is going on? I don't, I'm, this wasn't a consensual dynamic. And they're like, you were getting laid. What are you mad about? It's like, no, th- I didn't want this one. This wasn't one I was trying this. I wasn't going for this scenario. I didn't want this scenario. Right. And, and like for guys, it's really highly downplayed. Like you should be in any way feeling like you're violated when like, mm-hmm you're getting laid. What are you mad about? It's like, that's, I didn't want this. This is not a person I wanted to sleep with. Right. You know, that's, that's an adult. I mean, I was four years old. I didn't know what the hell was going on. You had no, all I know is that, that, you know, this guy's sticking my penis in his mouth and he's telling me he's going to kill me if I tell anybody. And I'm like, Holy shit. This is nuts. What the fuck? Oh, so, and I, I'm only being graphic because I want people to know that it happens no, I'm to with you. a lot of people, and it's no shame in admitting it and coming to terms with it. Because if you don't, it's going to create t- a lot of symptoms in your life. Correct. No, it's going I, to keep you from feeling like you deserve the kind of love that your heart desires. Yeah. So, bore you on that one. Yeah, just because somebody else has an issue with the way that they associate their body and love doesn't mean that you have to. Well, and when I was 16, I broke my foot and was in the hospital, and I got approached by another orator who wanted to have sex with me. So, Luckily, I was old enough to say no. Listen, Doc, I, I only know you as you are now. Are you like young Brad Pitt? Like, who? what are you? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't think so. What is happening? <laughs> like, I never had any orderlies come at me, and it was, it was before I had this beard. What is going on here? <laughs> well, you, you know, I will be honest with you. Perpetrators have a second sense to be able to tell who's going to fight and mm-hmm. who's going to so All right. I was, well, we were, well, listen, your 16 year old, you was probably had, had a solid amount of fuck off in there. I was lucky enough to be, uh, but I was so drugged that it almost happened. Ah, I see what you're saying. Cause you were, you were fighting yourself so hard. It made you look vulnerable. I got yes. you. And I know that he could tell that something had happened to me that um, made me much more likely to submit than to fight. Interesting. I just, I just had a moment of clarity in the midst of all the, medicine i was taking uh, after the surgery damn it doc fuck this world but i know this happens i was in a, when i was 18 i was at the whiskey in in hollywood mm-hmm. watching a concert and i was a hippie in those days had long hair and you know all that sort of thing some guy standing behind me took his dick out and stick it in put it in my hand and i, and I was so high i thought what the what what, what? you know and then That's... i realized what happening that wasn't a hippie handshake is it i've never had that handshake (laughs) i just pulled away and i just thought what the this is insane incorrect handshake. not how we greet but but if you have had something happen to you it's much more likely that you're going to have it happen again 
That's amazing. That's really why I'm telling, telling these stories because I know more than anything that perpetrators have a second sense to be able to tell who's going to fight and who's going to submit. Well, if you feel like you're one of those people who feels targeted, I will show you how to fight. Exactly. Come hang out with the come hang out with healthy Ben, and we'll teach you how to fight. We'll teach you how to know exactly. the difference. We'll give you the confidence that you need to like well, and, not and allow again, that situation. You, you heal those wounds, and people start stop coming after you because they can tell that you're not susceptible to uh, manipulation in that way. Mm. That's why it's so important to heal and break the cycle because then you stop being looked at and feeling and taken advantage of as a victim and you start to walk through life uh, with a kind of strength that you never imagined that you could have. Absolutely. Yeah. High support and we, we build those warriors. Yeah. If, if I, I open invite anybody who's like, man, I feel ashamed of these situations. Come hang out with healthy men who will have yeah. your back and protect you. We'll train you. Absolutely. The support system we have is very different, but man, what a, I don't have any of my guys who would be like, we're allowing that. Like there's just so you go, just so people know too, there's a majority good people. This is, there's, this isn't, this is, people will be like, well, I've heard these stories. It must be everybody. And people jump to these conclusions. A vast majority of men would, would smash these people if they knew. Oh, without a doubt. Look, I am, a, I'm not a necessarily an eternal optimist, but I have a lot of faith that uh, human nature inherently, in, you know, is good with exceptions of people that have personality disorders. And I'm sad that there are so many. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the idea is that if more people understood who it is that they are admiring and looking up to, the world would change a great deal. Well said. We need more mentors. We need more leaders. We need more people who are willing to push against the grain. And this, this leads into the COVID talk too, is like, it was actually phenomenal to hear the numbers. And I don't mean in a good way. It was more like, uh, it was was jaw dropping. When you find out that even, I think it was around 50% of the population, not even just United States, the world was like no critical thinking skills, just Uh whatever you're told they do. Like no right. questions, no, like what's going on or why would they do that? Or that doesn't seem like it makes sense. Like no question at all. Just you said, do this. I do it. Don't you think that's what fear does to people? It, Absolutely. It weakens us. One. And if we can give into it, we're easily manipulated. Absolutely. Heck, they've been doing this over and over and over again. Actually, this gets into like, now you start looking at control and manipulation where if like, I think it was even when you watch the documentaries for how did, uh, Germany become Nazis. They weren't right. always. They were highly no. democratic. They were a very advanced society. Like they weren't Nazis. They weren't just hating Jews and stuff. That wasn't a thing. When indoctrinated with enough fear and propaganda, all the rules. I actually I got flagged a long time ago when I made a video for that. When I was like, we're too smart now to fall for this. This could never happen again. Oh, when it's like, I wish that were true. But I mean, like, it was obviously me being highly sarcastic when, like, you're watching the same propaganda out there. And it's not just a left or a right thing. It's all over. Right. Like, it's, right. it's, it's, it's both sides indoctrinating the same fear mongering. Now, again, I, I'm with you. We write and we, we teach fear. And I'm like, that's just that's not that's bullshit. You guys don't see that. You know, and it's, I equated it to like a boogeyman insurance. Yeah. When, when they're like. Hide your kids. The boogeyman is coming to get them. And I'm like, <laughs> the boogeyman. And I'm watching my friends go, we need fucking boogeyman insurance and boogeyman alarms. And we need to get bo- boogeyman suits. And we need to get the boogeyman. And the kids got my fucking boogeyman. And they're like, wait, you got, wait, do you guys think that's a real thing? And they're like, the fucking boogeyman's getting my fucking kid. My fucking kid's going to get killed. And I'm like, that's not a, there actually isn't a boogeyman. The fucking boogeyman. And I'm like, yeah. we're losing our fucking minds here. No, can anybody? It's like watching pictures of Bigfoot. Like this is a sighting of the boogeyman, and everyone's like, we fucking knew it. And they're like prepping for the purge. And you're like, uh, ah, yeah. hold on here, guys. And they're like getting their boogeyman suits, which doesn't actually stop boogeyman, even if it was a thing. And I'm like, I don't know. 
you know, the, the biggest problem is that it keeps our economy going to live in fear. Because if we don't live in fear, we're not going to buy stuff we don't need. We're not going to drink to excess. We're not going to work overly work. We're not going to be violent. We're not going to do all the things that fear propagates. And it keeps the economy going. I really worry that if fear goes away, the economy is going to collapse because we'll stop buying all the shit we don't need to make ourselves well, feel Well, the, the economy would evolve into something healthy. Hopefully. Because it would be it would, it would become a more healthy aspect if you're not making purchases on fear and you're making purchases based on healthy oh. needs, desires, yeah. love. Like, like and, and this is why it's funny because if you look at then, if there is propaganda to be able to make the economy run on fear, who's profiting the most? And you already know which where's the highest profits going when it comes to fear. Well, isn't it the, the uh, big corporations in America and the and the politicians? Well, I'll, well, what do you what is the first thing prescribed if someone has anxiety or fear? Medicine, yeah, the pharmaceutical industry. They're making trillions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of money. Way more than cabbage. Way more than water. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, and so it's one of these things: is who's really who's really pushing fear. It's not, I'm not even trying to be, that's not even me being like, I don't have to do deep research. It's like, well, who's profiting the most off of this? That's not even, you don't even have to go into conspiracy theory. It's just, well, obviously the people who are like, you all have anxiety, but this is the, this is the cure and you don't have to do any work for it. Boy, if you find that magic solution, you and I are going to have this conversation in Tahiti. Well, that, well, that's the thing is like, I, I, how many, I've actually like, we've, I've removed like the need for the medication from people. I don't, I don't tell them to get off of medication just because there's going to be people who are like, you're, you're not a doctor. I'm like, hold on a second. I didn't say get off of your medication. I just say, let's work on the reason that you need it. And then you right. decide if you need it still. Yeah. Yes. Which is a very respectful, uh, loving perspective. Yeah. If they're like, I don't need it anymore. Cause I don't have, I'm not having anxiety attacks anymore. And yeah. I'm not scared anymore. And I feel yeah. confident and I feel proud and I feel good. And I know me and I'm not worried about things that aren't happening. And I have presence in the present. And my awareness is higher. And I've gone through even my tools on things to know, like, how do I handle situations if they do come up? And I'm not scared of them anymore. I'm more curious than anything. And I think that's something yeah. you and I both agree on is if you understand your inner strength and you understand the training and tools inside of yourself to take this superpower of looking into the future and instead of panicking, you're learning from and creating clairvoyance or preparation. Wouldn't you just be more curious? Well, what about recognizing how much resourcefulness that you have as a person that you don't really know? I have my seven, my seven tools for that. I just actually just talked to the person before this on that one. The seven resourcefulness is one. Oh, cool. Do you want to hear my seven? You ha you probably have sure. all seven. You have all seven. All right. So I say, all right, first off, I do the math equation. You seem good at math, so we'll get this very quickly. And people who have heard my podcast have heard this before. All right, let's do quick math. Out of all of the nightmarish and shit stuff and crazy things that you've been through in your life, what is the percentage of your survival rate? Well, right now it's 100%. 100 percent so you're good at math. I knew you'd be good at math. So, all right. We're at 100%. You've survived 100% so far up right yeah. now. Now, let's go through the seven tools that we've got for these situations. Do you have problem-solving skills? Absolutely. Okay, we got that. We got one. Creativity. Get us out of the box if I don't know the answer yet. All right, we got two. Sure. We got resourcefulness. I don't have it yet, but I can figure out a way to get it. Right. Support system. I don't know the answer, but I can call for advice or I can get someone to help me. Sure. Good. Um, any type of faith at all. It's not just you. You. You're, there's more to you than just you. You're not alone. Yeah. All right. Um, then let's get into, uh, are you more equipped now to handle things than before when you were much younger and going through tougher things? Yes. All right. And do you have any outlets at all that you can take some steam off so you can think a little more clearly? Sure. Well, you're seven for seven, good sir. I, you know what? I agree with everything that you said, and I think most people don't recognize how much they bring to the table because they've been, again, made to feel so ashamed of themselves and so inadequate. Yeah, which is really fun because shame goes into that's 
I've associated the different parts to a blame I put in with anger because it's all your fault, your fault. This is an allocation of authority telling you where it should be. It's also associated with excuses. I put those as separators, and they separate from themselves too. Um, okay. when, it, when it comes to doubt, though, which I'll, you want to have fun with doubt, I'll show you the exact way to beat doubt in one sentence because um, doubt's a monster, but people I, – I, I've I had coffee with doubt this morning. It cracks me up now. But uh, doubt is associated with the shame that goes into depression. And what I've noticed with depression is there's usually a shame stack. The people who go into depression, the way that I help people with depression is we have to do uh, prevention before intervention. You know, and so like, have you caught the negative self-talk? Because almost everybody I've helped with depression is brutal the way they talk to themselves. And they beat themselves to pieces. But that creates the weight where I call it the Atlas's burden where they're holding the weight of the world on their shoulders, but most of it is the shit they've given themselves. So if you catch that, it's like a, like a truck. If you get, catch the mud, like, well, if you catch, oh, shit, I hit mud, you can kind of do this back and forth and pull yourself out. You can get out of it. That's prevention. But if you don't catch it and you just spin the tires and spin the tires, the frame will go down until you bottom out. Once you bottom out, you need a tow truck. And that's apathy. Now, if you look at the, the correlation to what doubt is now, Doubt comes in through motivation. That's how, oh, you know what? You're going to love this. You're going to get ready to have some brain talk. You're going to love this, Doc. This is the map that I've built for human behavior. <clears throat> so let me, know, let me know you can see it. You're going to like this. All right. So I can see it. Yeah. So I got my very, glasses on here. The very core goes into our belief system, our values, and feelings. Now, it can be argued love, but we're not going there yet. Now, what I'm talking about is when your grief system is going on, this is your law system, denial, depression, anger, bargaining. Like when this is turned on and you're going through this, before you can even get to acceptance, I call it the race to acceptance, not because it's fast, but because it's the finish line. You got to go through all of these to get there. People, you already know better. People go fast, it's not go fast. I'm talking about the enemy within now. Now, doubt comes in through your feelings. Feelings is our weakest area. This is the weakest shot to come in. Now, we can argue values and belief, but let's just go with it for now because we'll have that conversation. Now, doubt comes in through motivation. If you have an idea, a dream, something that you want to do, it feels really, really good, and you believe it can be done, you're going to go into your goal system here. That's your potential actions, results, and then your attitude around it, and then continue, 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 right? Okay. You throw a little bit of doubt in here, uh, Doc, that's a stupid idea. That's not going to work. Okay. You're an idiot. Nobody will right. believe you. These are, you're not worth it. You're a piece of shit. We start throwing that in there and it starts attacking the motivation. Like, oh, is it a bad idea? That makes me feel not good. Now my belief is lower. I don't believe I'm putting that much potential in and so on. Here's how you challenge doubt. The definition for doubt is doubt offers nothing but takes from you everything. That's the definition. The way you can, the way you beat it is you challenge what the offer is. So, for example, I have a dream, let's just say, start a nonprofit to help, you know, abused kids. That's my dream. And they're like, yeah, but nonprofits are a stupid idea. Click on the button and you can become the hero in your own story. It's time to start making the choices to change. And the evolution that you're going to do begins with choosing the next step. This is the way. And together, we're always stronger.